good morning. Good morning. Um, on behalf of our director, Lorenzo Vedino, and the rest of the programming stream, I'd like to welcome you to George Washington University's campus. Uh, I'm Seamus Hughes, I'm the Deputy Director of the Program on Extremism. Uh, today we're going to be launching uh, the first of a series of policy papers as it relates to terrorism prevention in the U.S. Uh, so the, the idea is I'll give a quick overview and then we'll kick it into the panelists and then open it up to um, questions and answers. Very quickly, I think uh, it's, it's worth a discussion on the story, a very storied uh, history of countering and violent extremism in the U.S. Um, depending on who you ask, it started in the Bush administration with the words of ideas, uh, but it really went to supercharge uh, during the Obama administration with their 2011 uh, national strategy for domestic countering and violent extremism. Uh, a series of, of White House summits, uh, grants coming out of, of Congress, uh, and now during the Trump administration, essentially a reset and reevaluation uh, of the programs. We've seen uh, it also be a highly charged debate uh, in the US. On one side of the spectrum, saying that countering violent extremism is government overreach, uh, that it's targeting uh, only one uh, set of populations, uh, that it shouldn't be the role of government on these things. On the other side of the spectrum, uh, folks that say that, that countering violent extremism doesn't have measures of effectiveness, and it's too soft of an issue to address things like terrorism prevention. The, the recent events in Pittsburgh uh, and the like has recharged this debate. Uh, with, with some arguing that this is a time to reevaluate our prevention programs to see whether we're addressing all forms of extremism in a way that makes sense. We've seen individuals uh, make very uh, uh, strong arguments for why prevention efforts are needed and others using this as an opportunity to score political points. The program of extremism, we don't really do partisanship. Uh, it's not our gig. Uh, we're just interested in um, starting a conversation about terrorism prevention in the U.S. So unencumbered by political biases or um, views on this, we're going to press on. And so this is the launch of the first of the policy series. Uh, if you go onto our website now, you'll see our first paper, Terrorism Prevention in the United States, a Policy Framework for Filling the CVE Void, uh, produced by our uh, research fellow, Dr. Ferraro Ingram. In the coming weeks, we're also going to release another series of papers, uh, one by Bennett Clifford that looks at uh, responses to extremists in correctional systems, another one by Audrey Alexander that looks at policy responses to terrorist use of the internet. And so I encourage you to, to keep track of what uh, we're doing. And like I said, we're trying to start a conversation, a nuanced conversation, however novel that may be in today's time, um, but we're gonna try it anyway. So today we're going to have uh, four panelists, um, First will be Dr. Uh, Alistair Reed from uh, Swansea, also the former ICC director, who will give an overview of uh, European e efforts on countering violent extremism. In many ways, our European partners have been, um, for lack of a better word, forced to be creative when it comes to prevention as a result of uh, legislation and sentencing that is significantly less than the U.S. context. And so um, Dr. Reed will, will go over that. After that, Bennett Clifford will talk about his policy paper on extremists in federal correction systems. Uh, Audrey Alexander will talk about um, policy recommendations as it relates to online extremism. And finally, uh, Dr. Ingram will talk about his new uh, policy paper. Then we'll open up to questions and we'll go from there. That work? Great, thanks for everyone coming. Uh, I will kick it to you. Good morning everyone. I'd just like to start by saying thank you very much to the program Extremism for inviting me to come along and join this discussion. I'd like to start by saying that um, fundamentally the idea behind countering by extremism is a good idea. The first intervention, first point of intervention from the state against terrorism shouldn't be the knock on the door to arrest people after a terrorist attack. We should do everything in our power to be able to prevent terrorism from happening. However, as with all good ideas, the devil is in the detail. And I just want to share with you some of my insights from working with CVE from a European perspective over the last few years, both on a conceptual and a practical basis. On the conceptual <coughs> issue, the first problem with CVE is just what is countering violent extremism? It's a good idea, but it lacked focus, it lacked definition, 
and it ends up meaning very different things to very different people, to such an extent that actually it managed to achieve the impossible. It managed to unite both the right and the left of politics, but unfortunately in the distaste for it. Um, ironically, for entirely different reasons. The right saw it as too soft, the left saw it as too hard, and in the end, what CV really came down to was a collection of buzzwords that used to put down funding applications to make sure we tick the right boxes to get funded. In terms of CV's second phenomenon, it's, it's the scope of it. For some people, Cambridge and Brian Extremism was about addressing things at a societal level, about making sure the context never arose in which Brian Extremism could start. For others, CV was about identifying those people who were well on their pathway to radicalization, but doing something to prevent them from crossing over into violent extremism. But the goal between those two approaches is massive. The third conceptual issue is, who are we focusing on? Who are we targeting? Some people say the, the clues in the name were countering violent extremists, but actually, who are these violent extremists? In the early days when the focus was um, largely on, uh, on ISIS, that wasn't too much of an issue because ISIS is unique among terrorist organizations in that everybody agrees they're a bad thing. As soon as you move beyond ISIS, that consensus starts breaking down. <clears throat> and how do we actually determine you know, who is an extremist? What is extremism? We start focusing on extremist ideology. And then what is extremist ideology? And we're going to que quickly start blurring the lines between focusing people from their actions and their beliefs. And this causes very clear problems if you try to replicate such approaches in America, where you have very strong constitutional protections of freedom of speech. And then, at a practical level, to make four quick points, the first one was about optics and perceptions, about who it, who it was for targeting. At the beginning, it was largely targeting Islamist um, groups, essentially meant targeting the Muslim community, which meant if you're in the Muslim community, it didn't feel like you were it was countering violent extremism. It felt like it was countering the Muslim community. And this was ruthlessly exploited in the propaganda by various extremist groups. And you had this ironic situation where the policies which were enacted to counter radicalization often became the grounds of radicalization and they're being painted and perceived as this is an attack on the Muslim community. Some of this is being rectified now as a now focus on a broader um, spectrum of violent extremism, especially tacking on the far right. Second issue is who leads <coughs> CV projects? <coughs> if you take the example of um, the UK, where I'm from, it was a very state-centric approach, centrally organized by the government, this led to a couple of unintended consequences. One was that it became seen as part of the security apparatus. It was seen as being connected to the police and to the security agencies. And on one hand, this led to pushback from um, public servants, who, such as teachers and doctors and university lecturers, who were being asked to be, um, be aware of things, but they didn't want to be involved in anything that was connected to the security apparatus. But at the same time, it meant also in the communities where CV projects were being implemented, there was a perception that actually, are these projects really about engagement of community, or are they just fronts for um, spying for the security agencies? And people were reluctant in cases often to trust them and to share information, and some for fear that this be passed on to the police and later prosecutions, and so on. And a huge amount of effort has had to be put into trying to um, rebuild the trust. The third point is the need for a holistic approach. Now, countering violent extremism is not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve terrorism. The best it's ever going to do is to reduce the amount of people which get to the point in which they engage in violent extremism. So we still need to have the full counter-terrorism spectrum. But importantly, it needs to be completely integrated into it to avoid unintended consequences. If you look at the um, European history of countering um, terrorism over the last five years, it's really a story of 
changing policies after every policy we interact has had unintended consequences which we didn't foresee because we didn't take a holistic perspective. And the final point I want to make is about monitoring and evaluation. In our rush to fix a problem, in our rush to implement CBE projects, not enough attention was put on, can, on monitoring and evaluation. So simply, we spend millions of euros on various CBE projects, but we don't properly know whether they worked, and if they did work, how they worked. Now, as an academic, we like to be able to go away and do lots of research and stay in our ivory tower, but with terrorism and violent extremism, we don't have that luxury. The threat is now, so we can't go away and spend 10 years find, working on research to be certain what works and what doesn't work. We need to try things now, but we have a, a responsibility and imperative to make sure we have proper monitoring and evaluation so that everything that we try, we work out if it works, if it doesn't work, why not? If it works, why? And how we can make it better? And that is one of the, the elephants in the room with CV in Europe and one of the big missing links. And going forward, CV needs to have m and &E hot-wired into all of it. Uh, I'll just end there with those key points. I want to say I'm very thankful for being invited here today to be able to help um, our own launch this paper because this is something that needs to be a conversation about. Countering violent extremism, as I said, I think fundamentally is a good idea, but there's been lots of bad practice as well as lots of good practice. What we need to do is make sure we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater and identify what are the good bits of CVE we want to take forward to ensure we can properly prevent terrorism. Thank you, Seamus, and thank you, Alistair, as well, for the introduction, which I think set up a lot of the conceptual issues behind uh, not only in Europe, but also why in the United States there's been some difficulty in the rollout of uh, countering violent extremism programs. Uh, for myself and also for Audrey as well, we'll be focusing on granular areas where the United States can step up its response to violent extremism. I'm going to be talking about uh, how that plays out in the federal correctional system in the United States. Uh, based off research we've been doing in the program on extremism for the past couple months. Uh, and I'm going to divide it sort of into three parts. First is the landscape related to extremism in the federal correctional system, comparing the situation in the United States to the world of Europe. <coughs> Second, why uh, so far in the United States context we've been relatively unsuccessful at rolling out the same kind of innovative programming in federal correctional systems as has been uh, tried and tested in Europe. And third is some preliminary ideas for um, solutions and ways the U.S. can push the policy debate forward. Um, so. This issue of extremism in correctional systems in general uh, often comes to the fore of terrorism prevention efforts, uh, usually centered around uh, major incidents, although it's definitely been one of the major aspects of European states uh, and entities uh, countering violent extremism policies during the past five years. Uh, in the United States, it's less acute of an issue, uh, but that being said, uh, according to a database we've kept uh, at the program of extremism of uh, international terrorism-related arrests and convictions, um, there are about 275 individuals in that list, and over 80 are scheduled for release within the next five years. That is before 2023. Uh, that being said, despite that number, uh, this pales in comparison, I think, to a lot of the landscape in Europe, and that's for two primary reasons. The first being that during the past four years, especially with the rise of uh, the Islamic State and the situation in Syria, there's been a substantial uptick in arrests in most European countries. Uh, as well as convictions for extremist-related activity uh, across the spectrum. Uh, but as Seamus pointed out in the introduction, a lot of the issue in European countries deals with uh, the short sentences that they're able to provide and some prison systems not being well-equipped to handle processing uh, intel concerns, the integration of prison intel services with uh, the rest of the counterterrorism landscape in those countries. Um, but then the other factor of it is, of course, attacks perpetrated by uh, released um, formerly incarcerated violent extremists, most famous of course being uh, the cell responsible for the attacks in Paris in 2015 and Brussels in 2016, uh, but then a lot more recently in 2018 in Liège in Belgium of this year there was an individual who radicalized in the prison system according to Belgian authorities that uh, undertook a stabbing. Uh, in response to this, some European countries have started to unroll uh, intervention-based um, countering violent extremism policies, specifically within prisons. Uh, there are some interesting initiatives going on in the German state of Hesse, 
uh, and also in some Scandinavian countries as well. Uh, those programs are mostly in their beginning stages, but they draw on other experiences that those states have had with deganging and also with uh, countering uh, white supremacist uh, organizations in prison as well. Uh, in the US, our perspective is somewhat different. That mirrors a lot of the different threat and the different resources that we have here. Uh, the first thing is in comparison to many European countries, uh, the proportion of extremists to non-extremist offenders in the US correctional systems uh, is generally a lot lower. The reason, uh, just the overarching reason being that we incarcerate more people than any other country on earth, uh, which expands the prison population. In the Bureau of Prisons alone, uh, there's over 180,000 inmates, uh, for instance. Uh, the other factor of that is that uh, attacks committed by formerly incarcerated extremists in the United States are far less in number and less in the lethal. Now, I'm not saying that they don't happen. Two major examples from two sides of the spectrum would be Elton Simpson, one of the perpetrators of the 2015 uh, ISIS-inspired and claimed shooting in Garland, Texas. Uh, also across the aisle, uh, Fraser Miller Jr., an avowed white supremacist for most of his life, was incarcerated in the federal penitentiary system in the late 1980s, later did the shooting outside the Overland Park Jewish Community Center in Kansas, uh, currently sentenced to death. Um, so there's that aspect of it, that there's no attack to draw the public uh, into uh, counter extremism programming in prisons. But then also the US correctional system has been dealing with CT issues for a decent amount of time now, at least at the federal level. Uh, I mean, if you look at the history of it, the federal penitentiary system and federal correctional system has been incarcerating uh, ideological extremists dating back to the 1970s and even before that. Um, and after 2001, uh, the Federal Bureau of Prisons created a, speci a specific uh, counterterrorism unit. Now it's relatively well integrated into this uh, counterterrorism authority structure in the US, uh, as well as coordinates a lot of state and local efforts. Uh, it's in direct contact with law enforcement and maintains a liaison to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. So that's the good news from the US perspective, I guess, if you can call it that. The bad news is that we lag significantly behind our European partners in developing terrorism prevention programming in correctional systems. Uh, that's especially important given the number of extremists that are scheduled for release within the past five years. Uh, it's representing a significant gamble to hope that prison sentences alone will disengage or de-radicalize violent extremists. And the programming that currently is, uh, exists in assessment is either not tailored to ext address extremism specifically, or focuses more on quelling institutional misconduct rather than recidivism post-release. So how do we get to this stage? What is the reasons for why we lack the same kind of programming that's starting to be unrolled in European countries? There's a couple things. The first and foremost issue is the, the lack of data, um, both on post-release recidivism relate rates of violent extremists, but also on other questions related to uh, how many people are radicalizing in prison. Even beyond those two major questions, uh, the first one representing somewhat of an issue because there's only been a small uh, number of extremists who have been released for prisons. It's not necessarily suitable for a large-end study uh, to date. Uh, but the other thing is comparing extremists to other offenders. Do they recidivize at the same rate as the federal prison's uh, general recidivism rate, which is around 35%? Uh, do they behave in similar ways post-release to other categories of offenders, violent offenders, sex offenders? And in that sense, where are appropriate times throughout the correctional program where interventions could potentially divert somebody from that path? The second factor is the makeup of the federal correctional system here in the United States. Unlike in some of the European countries, it's not monolithic. Uh, in its management. Uh, the Federal Bureau of Prisons manages over 120 very disparate facilities. Uh, it also oversees others. They have to communicate across these federal, state, and local levels. Uh, the facilities themselves range on security level, on geographic area, uh, by facility type. It ranges from the pre-trial stages of detention to residential re-entry, um, getting uh, offices like the Administrative Office for Probation and Pre-Trial Services, uh, looped in who are responsible for handling offenders post-release uh, is also an issue. And unlike in some European countries which have designated uh, extremist wings uh, in their prisons, uh, the United States takes no such approach. Uh, instead, they stratify based off risk and send people to appropriate facilities. That's one of the ways the U.S. has benefited from that patchwork report, uh, effort uh, in that it's able to tailor security classifications and uh, locating prisoners based off their risk. Uh, the downside of it is it makes any large-scale programming effort very difficult. 
the third thing is just based on resource allocation, and uh, this is familiar to most people uh, dealing with the Bureau of Prisons, but less so, I, I think, in, in counterterrorism circles, just how many things the Bureau of Prisons has to deal with on a limited budget uh, on an everyday basis. Uh, if you look at uh, overcrowding, uh, gangs, counter narcotics, other areas of immediate need are all on the top of the Federal Bureau of Prisons agenda. Uh, it's not that addressing extremism is not a priority for the Bureau of Prisons, uh, but their need is to develop programming that will be beneficial to the greatest number of inmates within custody. If you compare, uh, by generous estimates, several hundred extremist offenders in the Bureau of Prison system, although uh, I can't say that definitively, as no specific calculation like that is available to the public, but to compare that to, uh, for instance, the 23,000 gang-affiliated inmates in Federal Bureau of Prisons custody, many of whom pose a very high risk from an institutional misconduct perspective, you start to get a sense of how the Bureau of Prisons has to streamline resources to fit the greatest need. Uh, the last thing uh, I'll say about why programming has so far been unsuccessful is the way that Bureau of Prisons and the federal correctional system writ large uh, assign programming to inmates. It's based off the classification and detection model, uh, which looks at the risk factors of an individual inmate uh, and then assigns programming based off their risk of committing institutional mis misconduct. That's an important point because they're concerned about uh, the threat that inmates pose to staff, uh, of violating prison rules, but a lot of those detection models are not suitable for detecting whether someone will recidivize post-release. Uh, that's something that will be important. Uh, uh, and, and more importantly, there's nothing in, pace, in place to triage violent extremist offenders in the programming that seeks to reduce their recidivism rate after release uh, as well. Uh, that's something important. That's tied into a broader debate in the United States about criminal justice reform with other people suggesting alternative models for how uh, the Bureau of Prisons does that calculation. Uh, but it's something to consider uh, at multiple levels of government if, that, if uh, programming in prisons and jails is something that's important. Uh, last few ideas, and then I'll turn the floor over to uh, Audrey for the online section of these. Uh, I don't want to completely spoil my paper on this, which will come out next week. Uh, it has very detailed policy recommendations in it. Uh, my three ideas uh, in general, I would also be happy to discuss these during the question and answer system. First things first, I think a recidivism study of violent extremist offenders is necessary. On a large scale, there are already some efforts in this arena, but uh, more data, the better. Uh, second, uh, the consideration of a risk needs uh, responsivity assessment model uh, for violent extremist offenders. Uh, and then third, there are ideas in the paper about scaling up some existing uh, small scale efforts to provide early custody stage interventions uh, to violent extremist offenders. Some of those programs have been tested out in s certain jurisdictions, uh, New York being one, Minnesota being the other. Uh, and again, would happy to answer any questions about that during the question and answer session. Tough acts to follow. Um, well, I just want to begin this morning. Uh, I'm bringing this a little bit closer because I think we're having a little bit of audio, so hopefully I'm not yelling at you guys. Um, but I want to start by saying thanks to my co-panelists because they have helped shape a lot of our ideas as well as uh, to our team in the room because uh, it really takes a village to raise a policy series and <laughs> that has been our, our experience. So today I'm tasked with laying out uh, this, this very shocking problem uh, that we have something wrong with coping with terrorist content online. Uh, I'm sure very new to everybody. It's not remotely new, and it's something we've been dealing with. So laying out the problem is going to be my first objective. And then I'm going to sort of explore how can we, how can we talk about it and how can we think about it. Um, and then address what's required to sort of um, dexterously focus on the problem. And then lastly, what are the, the specifics for achieving, achieving this objective? So first, uh, what is the problem? Terrorists and violent extremists are proactive in the face of changing circumstances, especially online. But the US government's response to this issue is fundamentally reactive. And that's true for many of its allies as well. Um, as we all know, reactive environments are not especially great for making good decisions. And I think that that's happened here in many ways because if you start tracing back when we started looking at uh, the online space, 2005, 2006 are some of the first times we start asking people to take down content. So, um, at, at least terrorism related content. So, uh, in hindsight, the US government's response to tech related threats are difficult to comprehend and even harder to articulate in a really cohesive way. Uh, 
Because without coordination and without a guiding conceptual framework, the U.S. never decided what should be done, who should do it, and what those efforts would actually entail on a, <coughs> a tactical level. So tasked with the job of doing something in the face of terrorist, terrorist content online, an eagerness for progress um, to prevent terrorists and violent extremists from spreading their messages in the digital sphere has led many Western countries, and including the U.S., to adopt these patchwork uh, responses that are confounding and even disproportionate. And these responses are, are used to deal with a long-term, dynamic, and certainly asymmetric threat. So next, how can we think about it? There are so many competing agendas that, that define the behavior of these players. Um, just to give a few, we have governments and all that that entails. We have civil society, technology providers, and of course, terrorists and violent extremists. Terrorists and violent extremists are comprised of their top-down models, their leadership, their propaganda disseminators, as well as whatever people around the world choose to interpret that. Um, the broad base of sympathizers, as well as um, <coughs> things like affiliates. Um, so looking at all of this, we have to say, in this climate, um, ad hoc and knee-jerk responses are genuinely bad for pre preventing and countering terrorism and violent extremism, especially in the digital space, where we have all of these different sort of market forces um, and, and speech considerations that vary from country to country. So I think that I'm going to raise some of the critiques of, of the current approaches, but again, I think um, without go in the paper I go through a lot of the different steps, but uh, we don't empower players in the right way. And we can look to address that by, with legislative fixes and changes. Next, we don't sync well with each other. We have initiatives that are being conducted by the Department of Defense that are, are uh, dealing with cyber capabilities. Uh, and a lot of this is targeting infrastructure for terrorist organizations, while we're also trying to message them or understand their propaganda at the same time. So looking at all of these to, to, to create a more uh, synergistic response. Next, we don't successfully navigate the range of materials. As I stated earlier, we have official aspects for, for both right-wing extremists and, and um, IS, which is a lot of where I've studied. They, they have official, unofficial, and organic responses and organic speech in response to uh, their movement. But realistically, um, not all problematic co content breaks the law or violates terms of service. And in the US, we have lots of, lots of protections in this area, and people say, well, terrorist speech isn't protected. Well, what happens when they're sharing a news article that validates or ethereal, ethereally validates their point, but doesn't necessarily violate the law or, again, break terms of service? Um, and next, the, the, a lot of the tools that we're using do not reflect or address the virtual ecosystem that matters. And again, this is bad for countering terrorism and violent extremism. Um, we're, we're sort of, there's systematic organ failure, but we're only addressing like the liver. So figuring out how we can sort of uh, help all of these different factors that are keeping the system going to be working uh, at their highest efficiency. So for example, there's a lot of political focus on content removal and suspensions of accounts on the leading social media companies. This is common Facebook, Google, Twitter. Well, the problem is all of the people that we're studying have moved on. And they didn't just move on recently. Back in 2014, they were already on. I found something in 2008 talking about how one strategist was using archive.org. Um, so this, this isn't a fundamentally new problem, even though we, we tend to act like it is. Um, but we need to be paying attention to things like static websites, financial technology, encrypted messengers, file sharing sites, secure browsers, protected email services, mobile security applications. I could keep going, and it would be a double day too. But the, the point is, we just really need a more, more comprehensive uh, toolkit. It's not just about the online and offline, because we have to layer on that we have um, something with push notifications. So we've got a, a recruiter sort of with you all the time with an encryption layer on top of that. So just being able to think about this in a more dynamic way. So what's required to address the problem? So if the issue of technology and terrorism is shaped by all of these competing agendas, what can we do to make sure all the agendas that we can help dictate are actually on the same page? And how can the government work to align those agendas under a shared directive? Um, the government can discern uh, what should be done, who should do it, and what those actions might entail. And I think that we can really start um, to, to be opportunistic and pushing it forward. 
rather than whack-a-mole, cat and mouse, or whatever game we're, we're currently playing to push uh, sympathizers from one platform to another, I think that initiatives can consider the ways to encircle the organization uh, where it exists, striking a better balance between regulation, regulation, censorship, expulsion, and counter-information. So by progressively marginalizing the tools that enable radicalization and mobilization, reducing exposure to problematic actors and content, and mitigating the polarizing nature of terrorist violence, both policymakers and practitioners can work to depreciate the hold that extremists have online. Strategic policy needs to see this problem as it is. And realistically, it's not existential. Um, and we need to work to prevent terrorism and violent extremists in a pragmatic, pragmatic and proportional way that adheres to the rule of law. Terrorism and violent extremists um, are certainly problematic online, and I can't deny that. But it, again, it's not existential until we start overreacting by suppressing speech, uh, advocating for technology advancements that may be used uh, in abusive ways by other governments. Um, a lot of what we can do here is actually just work to, to mitigate the problem and, and um, sort of keep it where it is and push it to the side. But we don't this isn't a problem that we fundamentally need to defeat. And is that really a tangible objective, especially online? So what are the specific specifics for achieving this? And I realize I've cruised through this conversation really quickly, and this is what's been so great about working in the office with my friends and colleagues is we get to talk about this for days on end instead of just in 10 minutes. But so as terrorists and violent extremists fight for a cause in the digital sphere, governments and their partners should embrace a broader and perhaps more tempered but comprehensive approach to proactively, not reactively, <coughs> marginalize the effects of violent extremism online. The political and tactical reliance on content removal inadvertently aggrandizes terrorists, validates extremist uh, narratives of abuse, and polarizes vulnerable communities. The tactic of takedowns is certainly useful, but that alone is a tactic, not a strategy. To develop a more appropriate and sustainable response to terrorist use of digital communications technologies, we need to enthusiastically explore additional methods that complement content removal. And um, also start to think more holistically about all of these different pieces. So again, how can DOD's agenda line up with what we're doing um, in the State Department and line up with what we're doing in law enforcement? Uh, and then how does deciding what we do as government better empower our ability to say, civil society, here's what we'd really love if you could compliment us with. Or technology companies, here's how we can improve this relationship. So some of the specific recommendations that I address in my piece First, examine opportunities for legal redress um, and utilize laws uh, to intervene in criminal activity involving digital communications. That's one component that we really need to, to get into. Next, political leaders and courts should review and amend outdated laws that hinder the government's ability to exercise good governance online. We get really into the weeds of this um, and, and we can get into it in the questions if we like. But I think but, um, by promoting internet safety, um, using a lot of these mechanisms, we can actually begin to reach target audiences with counter messaging. So next, we need to facilitate a more productive engagement between government entities and technology providers and private companies. Um, a respectful and productive relationship with the private sector is vital to the US government's efforts to address the intersection of virtual communications and terrorism. This approach is by no means light on tech companies, but it's more strategic. Instead of saying, we want you to go further and faster, says, okay, these are the things we can use, this is the approach we're gonna take, here's how we can complement each other. And actually, by supporting technology companies who are also faced with the challenge of not knowing what to do, we can actually guide that agenda a bit better. So government, for example, government representatives can ask technology providers and private companies, namely social media companies, but also others, um, to create training kits and toolkits to help civil society groups know how to use their tools. Um, beyond social media messaging applications, political leaders should try to enable other technology service providers to prevent and counter exploitation of their technologies. And this includes file sharing platforms, web archives, link shorteners, email services. This is again where I get to list all of the tools. And sure, a lot of these players don't wanna to come to the table for very understandable reasons. And understanding those market pressures is a huge part of what needs to be our approach to addressing and coming to the table with us. Right now, um, content removal is really only feasible for a few of the biggest companies. 
uh, because the resources it takes to do that successfully are really challenging. But what can we do in a preventative capacity to start um, encouraging companies to work together or inf information sharing among companies? And one of the recommendations we also look at is rallying behind industry-led um, industry self-regulation through organizations like Tech Against Terrorism which creates tools in um, a lot of conferences for technology providers about things that we would all find probably pretty boring about like algorithms and using artificial intelligence and all, all of these components to say how can we get this to work in, in a technical capacity. Um, so if we'd like to get into that later, I'll be happy to, but the ultimate takeaway here is as opposed to emphasizing the tactic of takedowns, government representatives must work to mobilize um, both, both communities, civil society, um, technology providers, uh, across the board to, to push against the echo chambers um, in, in all these different and more creative ways. So thanks so much. I'll pass it. Okay, well, um, firstly, I want to thank everyone who is here and, of course, who are listening in uh, online for their time. and. My thanks in particular to Lorenzo and Seamus for their support um, for this series, more broadly and specifically to this, my first publication for the program. Um, and I'm also going to thank the team here, um, particularly Audrey, Bennett and uh, Helen for their time um, helping to get this, to get the paper to this point. Uh, and of course it's always good to be um, talking on a panel with Alec and we really appreciate you being here. Um, the purpose of the policy paper we released today uh, is to offer a non-partisan framework of strategic policy recommendations to help inform a terrorism prevention strategy for the United States homeland. There is currently no overarching prevention strategy to complement counterterrorism efforts, and this was explicitly acknowledged in the National Strategy for Counterterrorism released last month, which stated, quote, over the past 17 years we have built a robust counterterrorism architecture to stop attacks and eliminate terrorists, but we have not developed a prevention architecture to thwart terrorist radicalization and recruitment. It goes on to say, again quote, that there is a need to institutionalize a prevention architecture to thwart terrorism as a key priority action. This policy paper attempts to lay out some broad markers for that effort, while subsequent policy papers dig down further into the details of those components. I should also add that we have a range of occasional policy papers, some of which uh, will provide further legal and international perspectives to this terrorism prevention in the United States question. Uh, Alastair provided some insights today into his contribution to that larger body of work. So while there is currently no overarching preventative strategy in the United States, this should not be misunderstood to mean that there is a clean slate upon which to develop such a policy. Indeed, the path towards formulating a terrorism prevention strategy requires careful consideration of the interplay of policy context, threat environment, and legal considerations that will present both challenges and opportunities in any attempt to develop a terrorism prevention strategy for the homeland. And I want to very quickly look at each of these three factors. So let's start with policy context. The architects of a terrorism prevention strategy will need to both learn from and break clear of the history, the legacy of preventative efforts in the United States and beyond. In the United States, um, as Seamus said, this dates back, at least in a contemporary sense, to 2006 with the Bush administration's national security strategy. But it was not until 2011, under the Obama administration, um, that this was actively pursued and they sought to implement a preventative strategy under the banner of CBE. Now, I'm sure everyone in this room and online uh, knows about the criticisms that effort received at the time. Experts, um, some of whom are sitting up front and I notice uh, in the audience today, pointed to the lack of a coherent overarching preventative strategy, inadequate funding and, and responsibility being spread over too many federal agencies as fundamental problems. Community representatives expressed concerns about its subjective and disproportionate focus on Muslim Americans, while civil rights advocates questioned its constitutionality and empirical basis. Now, with the Trump administration came an abandonment of the previous administration's efforts with not only nothing to fill that policy void, but inflammatory rhetoric and withdrawal of funding for community-based programs, which uh, has been assessed by many as undermining potential opportunities and exacerbating the challenges associated with implementing effective preventative strategies. Now, this context is important because any efforts to develop a preventative architecture in the United States will need to contend with this recent history 
and how it has shaped perceptions in not only strategic policy and practitioner circles, but the communities most likely to be affected by its implementation. Next was the violent extremist threat environment within the homeland, uh, which can be most succinctly assessed as diverse, fluid, and volatile. Yes, the threat from the extreme right is the most common and appears to be increasing in frequency and lethality, while the homegrown jihadist threat persists and on a per action basis, I believe still remains the most lethal. But the diversity of ideological motivations driving violent extremists in the United States is in itself a significant challenge. This diversity means that there is no typical demographic profile of an American violent extremists. This diversity contributes to a certain volatility within the national security environment as the threats posed by certain groups and actors, such as, for instance, the extreme right, may contribute to the mobilization of other groups and actors, for example, the extreme left, in a kind of counter-movement dynamic. And this volatility is being exacerbated by the outreach and influence operations of foreign-based state and non-state actors. So, diversity, volatility, fluidity. Any preventative strategy will need to take these into account, not only during formulation and implementation now, but the strategic policy posture that will need to evolve over time. The violent extremist threat, as Audrey uh, highlighted, is a perpetual threat. It wasn't born on September 11, 2001, or even April 19, 1995. So preventative efforts will not require us to just focus for a year, for a few years, break the back of this terrorism thing, and then go back to business as usual. No, terrorism prevention needs to be proportional. Proportional to the terrorist threat, proportional in context to other national security threats and broader policy issues. And so it needs to be fiscally responsible. And it needs to be positioned as a facet, as one of many national security and public policy issues, whose priority amongst countless other priorities will inevitably and necessarily shift over time. Finally, there are important legal considerations that need to be taken um, into account by strategic policy architects for a simple reason. At the heart of any preventative strategy will be a system of pre-criminal interventions which are inherently contentious for democratic governments generally, and particularly contentious for the United States, given its constitution. A certain set of issues have emerged consistently across the West within, with the implementation of preventative CVE policies, not only in Europe, as Alice there described, but in my own country, Australia, where I saw the impact of CVE strategies firsthand and upfront, working uh, at the pointier end of counterterrorism operations. I think it is important for all of us to consider how this legacy and context what it means for practitioners and communities, the opportunities it provides to learn from the past while breaking from it, and the challenges it presents for the formulation and implementation of a terrorism prevention strategy. So let's quickly draw out some of the key features of this framework of institutional and policy recommendations for insights, I hope, into its logic and some of its strategic policy nuances. In the uh, policy paper, terrorism prevention refers to a spectrum of government-led activities, central of which is a multi-tiered system of interventions enacted to prevent individuals from breaking United States terrorism, hate crime, and related laws. That is, engaging in or supporting ideolo ideologically motivated violence. This definition hints to the four interlocking pro policy principles that inform the proposed approach. Rule of law, the individual, proportionality, and public outreach. On this basis, government-led preventative interventions would occur under the conditions of reasonable suspicion that an individual may commit terrorism, um, under USC 2331 to 2339, hate crime and criminal rights offences, under uh, USC 2241 to 49, um, and I should also highlight that this broad definition must also cover related but more generic federal and state uh, offences. The challenge of reasonably and consistently distinguishing between those treated as terrorism prevention targets and those elevated to criminal subjects, especially given the standard of reasonable suspicion, would be based on the nuances of each case and the body of precedence that builds over time to inform such decisions. <coughs> 
Now, this narrowing of the scope of federal government intervention activities, if you contrast it, what I just proposed to what Alistair described earlier, it is a significant narrowing. It is designed to not only be constitutionally sound, but broaden opportunities and responsibilities for non-government interventions, for example, from civil society and the private sector. It is imperative that acts of political violence are met with severe punishments, given that a central feature of democratic political and legal systems is the protection of non-violent expressions of dissent, for example, via freedoms of speech, and non-violent pathways for political change, for example, via elections. At the same time, preventative efforts that involve democratic governments intervening in the lives of its citizens prior to a crime being committed needs to ensure that those freedoms and rights designed to facilitate non-violent political engagement are protected. As a counterterrorism practitioner, as I said, working at the pointy end of these efforts, I always worried about how the dilution or removal of such protections risked undermining the population's faith in the ability of democratic systems to deal with criminal and national security issues. Put simply, democratic governments have unique responsibilities not to engage in certain activities. So the pre terrorism prevention approach narrows the focus of government interventions and grounds it in rule of law, rather than more ambiguous notions of extremism and radicalization. A narrower focus grounded in more tangible foundations may also enable a more rigorous approach to empirically measuring the effectiveness and efficiency of terrorism prevention efforts. For those of you who uh, may go on to read the policy paper, you'll find six strategic policy components with a range of recommendations, and I'll canvas some of them now. Legislative changes are recommended, such as the addition of criminal statutes to domestic terrorism offences in, in the United States Code. Such a change has important implications that include the broadening of tools available to practitioners, both on the prevention side and the counterterrorism side, strengthening the legal foundations necessary to more robustly prevent and counter domestic terrorism. And such changes help to negate criticisms that Muslim communities are disproportionately targeted by such activities. The policy paper also suggests support to provide good Samaritan status um, to non-government initiatives as a way to assist with appropriate legal cover, which is often an obstacle for greater engagement in intervention activities um, by, for example, community groups. Additionally, updating the list of prescribed foreign terrorist organisations to encapsulate the full range of ideologically motivated violent groups could provide terrorism prevention and counter-terrorism authorities with more robust tools to pursue domestic threats in the homeland. Communities have an essential role to play in preventative strategies. So at the foundation of that multi-tiered intervention system I described earlier is a community safety campaign that has two aims. First is to provide training to frontline professionals so that they are better equipped to identify and respond appropriately to individuals demonstrating warning signs or indicators, however you want to describe it, of someone vulnerable to self or other directed violence. This awareness effort should not be specific to terrorism, but rather have a broader focus. Second, the awareness effort should inform practitioners about the variety of support services and intervention initiatives across government and non-government that may be available. Again, not just terrorism or violent extremist related initiatives, but potentially a range of programs. Now what this does is raise awareness about not only how to identify potential problems, but where to get further support without narrowing focus to terrorism alone. Terrorism is thus positioned within the context of other societal problems, many of which will be far more pertinent in local communities. Yes, the net is broader, but if this effort identifies someone at risk of self or other harm, I know again there was another mass shooting overnight, for example, if it allows communities to better identify those individuals who are susceptible to different types of violence, then there is an overall uh, benefit without the downside we've seen in other contexts, which Alistair could speak about, um, when there is this myopic focus on terrorism. The policy paper also addresses the issue of federal departmental responsibility. It suggests that at the federal level, a lead government agency should be responsible for the overarching implementation and coordination of the terrorism prevention strategy to concentrate accountability and transparency. The Department of Justice was suggested as a potential lead agency given that 
it would reinforce the rule of law approach, which underpins the framework, and that much of the bureau bureaucratic and jurisdictional reach is captured in the agencies and offices within its remit, such as the FBI and BOP. Public outreach, especially strategic communications, are given a multifaceted and central role in the terrorism prevention framework uh, to keep the public informed about the strategy's intent and activities for transparency and building goodwill, to raise awareness about the range of programs available as a capacity building mechanism, in other words, raising awareness to tap into what is already there, and as a means to confront the appeal of violent extremists and reduce the impact of terrorist words and actions. Last is the expanded role for civil society and the private sector in this approach. Narrowing the scope of government-led interventions opens space for non-government programs that, for instance, may target individuals at a much earlier stage of the radicalization process. Regarding the private sector, with a combination of policy carrots, such as tax concessions and sticks, perhaps fines and regulations, not just social media, but a whole range of companies must actively demonstrate that their efforts at self-policing are evidence-based and substantive rather than superficial and symbolic. Overall, government should try to avoid over-imposing directly onto the private sector, but rather use a balance of po policy and regulatory mechanisms to shape how markets engage with responsible versus irresponsible companies. In closing, the dynamic that is sought by this mix of strategic policy components is a simultaneous narrowing of government interventions, an expansion of non-government interventions, and a broadening of community awareness programs with the desired effect of being um, of having a quicker identification of at-risk individuals, their channeling into appropriate intervention programs, and at a more macro level, eroding violent extremist narratives of government overreach, persecution, and the arbitrary dilution of democratic protections for some uh, over others. Filling the terrorism prevention void in the United States requires a complex balance of strategic policy components, government and non-government activities, a drive to recalibrate as the threat environment evolves, and a commitment to protecting democratic freedoms and rights. This Mercy uh, Balancing Act will be a perpetual challenge for current and future administrations. But fortunately, um, this is one of the very few issues that has very strong bipartisan support. So thank you. I was gonna thank the panelists, but you guys did that for me, so thank you. Um, again, thank you for your, for your comments. You know, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask uh, a question or two, and then I'll open up to the audience if that's okay. Um, and Hororo, since you've got the, the unenviable position of having a, a public paper already out there, um, let's, let's start with you. So we've seen countering violent extremism go through a, a lot of different iterations. Um, chief among it is NAME, right? Um, depending on the audience, it's community resiliency, it's safeguarding, it's countering violent extremism, and now it's terrorism prevention. Um, you know, to, to borrow a phrase from uh, a governor from the north, uh, is the name change basically just lipstick on a pig? Uh, <laughs> what's, what's, is there a, a reasoning behind what you're advocating for that, that, that makes sense other than just you know, CD and TP, now it's a shorter acronym? Could you dive into to what you're sure. thinking about with that name change? Um, well, I think that, uh, and, and I, um, I know there are many who have written on the issue of kind of CVE and, 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 and any kind of criticism or compliment of CVE kind of results in there being criticisms, as Alistair kind of pointed to before, from kind of both sides. Because people say, oh, that's not CVE, this is CVE. Oh, well, no, no, this is CVE, that's not CVE. That's part of the problem, is that it's, it, has, it has been um, quite ambiguous. But if you look at the strategic policy detail in this paper, um, it's all drawn from CVE theory and practice. There's very little in this paper, I have to say, um, that isn't um, that, that 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 is new. It it may be unique in some ways in terms of its in, in some minor ways in terms of its calibration. But the strategic policy components are drawn from years of years of theory and practice. So of course it's a good question. Why terrorism prevention? Why not just call it this? Why not just call it this other thing? Well. First and foremost, most importantly, terrorism prevention as a term most accurately and succinctly captures what we are trying to do with this policy architecture. You know, it is a 
it is a narrowing of that concept. Terrorism prevention implies proactivity. Counter-terrorism is what you do after things have gone wrong. Um, terrorism prevention is not new. It did not show up a couple of years ago. Terrorism prevention has been in this field. In fact, it's been in this field longer than CVE has as a term, and it's been linked to, um, uh, for the most part, rule of law kind of a, 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 a approaches. So I think that um, what terrorism prevention also provides is a break from that history, from, from that past. Optics matters in this field. It matters as much as substance, and I think that there is a value to to that renaming. There's a value to the renaming because it's because it's accurate, um, and there's a value to that renaming, um, but because there is momentum behind it in this country. Uh, I'll open the, the floor if anyone has questions. Back to board. Oh, uh, thank you again, James, for organizing this. It was great. So I've got two unsolicited feedbacks, so you can take with a grain of salt. First of all, for Dr. Cliff. Um, just uh, one of the things that occurred to me is as you're looking at the federal level, uh, when you drill down at the state level, you get significantly different manifestations of the ways in which radicalization, I'll just say for the Muslim populations, occurred. So if you, if you compared, for example, New York with New Jersey and Pennsylvania, um, one of the studies that I did for Governor McGreevy was that in New York, you only had Wahhabi-trained imams. Whereas in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, you had five percenters, and you had Sufis, and you had Shias. And so the level of radicalization post 9-11 was significantly lower. In part, it was a reflection of the diversity of Muslim options, but also the fact that it wasn't just Saudi-trained imams who'd been flown over in these junkets and imbued with a very radicalized you know, Wahhabi ideology, which is very close to ISIS. Um, second thing. The Bureau of Prisons is very reticent to do any of this research because it would admit that there is a problem. So I sort of wish you well and good luck as you move <laughs> forward. But they, they've rejected, including every, like DOJ funded research, they've rejected every request to go into the prisons to do research. But there is one woman in the UK, Noemi Buhana, who works with Paul Gale, if you're familiar. So she's gone into the UK, and so you might have some really interesting um, results from uh, as a comparison. Um, and then most of the terrorists are on Supermax, so I don't know if you're looking at sort of people who are radicalized before they get to prison or the radicalization process that's occurring in prison, but just to make those distinctions. And I'll stop now and say thank you. And Herrera, one thing that came up yesterday at the NCTC meetings is that the FBI doesn't understand where everyone from the ACLU to the New America Foundation to um, Southern poverty is getting the 71% versus the 26%. And part of it, when you talk about the legislative amendments that you're thinking about moving forward, is that a lot of the, what we would consider to be domestic terrorism or DT, is being uh, conflated or separated out from um, hate crime. And so the FBI is not doing a really good job, unless the person's affiliated with a group, they're separating out, and they're, so they're not getting the same numbers. So that might be one of the potential suggestions, is to, to have a more rigorous interpretation or definition of what is domestic terrorism, so that we're not losing the hate crimes when it's not affiliated with a group, but Pittsburgh would still count, and North Carolina over a parking spot would still count, and so on. I'll just quickly say that, that, that that's a really excellent point, and, and, and one of the... One of the several, well, actually, a couple of the, uh, of the lawyers that had read that had read the policy paper had actually highlighted had actually highlighted that, and it said that um, that it's important to not draw an explicit distinction between kind of hate crimes and these other offences, and that in fact um, criminal civil rights offences need to be encapsulated into that, as does um, the more generic um, charges at the federal and state level, murder and assault, and this type of thing. Um, that 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 that. that that, that may um, be used as a substitute for those elevated federal crimes. And no, that's a great point. Yeah, I'll also comment as well. First, thank you for the comments as well. And my parents will be told it's Mr. Clifford, not Dr. Clifford. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it any day of the week. Inshallah, uh, <laughs> Mustafa. Um, the, uh, the three things I wanted to touch on are just the encompassing of the state uh, based problem. Some of that is covered in the paper, but it's also worth. 
saying as well to a previous point that within the Bureau of Prisons itself, these stratifications between various uh, facilities, whether it's super max ranging all the way down to low and medium security institutions, prison camps, all also have very definitive environments based off the facilities makeup. While BOP exercises oversight, all of those circumstances in facilities tend to be different even at the federal level. That's something that's noted in the paper as well, that approaching it from a solution perspective is likely to be trial focused on individual prisons rather than placing a top-down strategy uh, for interventions. And the development of those programmings will need to take into account the diversity between facilities. Uh, about uh, the question of religi religiosity and religious material provided, we actually, um, through a FOIA re request, made, got a list of the material available to inmates within uh, Florence, so AgMax. Um, and some of it's interesting, and uh, without saying the, the side of debate it is, obviously there's a clear line in the sand from a correctional perspective overall. The development of conservative religiosity is sometimes seen as a, as a good thing for most prisoners to some extent, be, especially for violent offenders. Uh, because uh, like uh, the, the example one person used when in an interview with St. Francis of Assisi, of course, uh, going into prison, reforming themselves, uh, attracting to a uh, puritanical model of religion that focused on uh, what was happening in the afterlife instead of the material life. Obviously, that has a lot of uh, uh, potential benefits, but also on the same time, it, it's important to be wary of those concerns, especially in the hands of folks with a lot of time on their hands and maybe not as much religious knowledge to interpret those uh, kinds of texts. Uh, as I know at the federal level, there's a very heavy vetting process for all religious uh, officials that provide services to inmates uh, regardless of their religion, um, whether those concerns hold up at the state level, uh, not aware of, but something also to keep in mind as we talk about the diversity of the correctional system here. Other questions? Yep. Um, hi, my name is uh, Mark Garcia. I'm with the National Governors Association. And for transparency purposes, uh, we're one of the 26 grant recipients from DHS. We're working with right now a class of states to basically do a statewide strategy um, to prevent bond extremism in the state. So um, this has really been an interesting conversation. Um, a, a few things. I, I definitely agree with the points that you just made as far as using terrorism prevention. Terrorism has a legal definition to us, so therefore, we're not considering kind of hate crimes in that 2016 you had over 4,000 states and localities report hate crimes, some of which could probably fill into um, uh, terrorism uh, by definition. So one, I'm curious, should we um, loop in, and this is more for BOP and then state corrections and so on and so forth, should we loop in those folks who are in, in prison who might not be there for that long and therefore can be reintegrating society five to 10 years as opposed to those who Whereas we want to think about this, it should be a public health issue, and maybe it should be best focused in Health Human Services or CDC. So do you think, A, the question for BOP, but secondly, if this needs to be transformed more from the criminal space to the public health arena? So anyone can answer, but thank you. Do you want to go first? Please do. All of them. So uh, again, only with the Bureau of Prisons definition, which is actually a lot wider, I think, because they're able to deal with the post-crime atmosphere okay. rather than the pre-crime atmosphere, but the Bureau of Prisons identifies extremists as not only international terrorists, but also uh, includes homegrown violent extremists, domestic terrorists, and sovereign citizens who are also looped into the jurisdiction of how they define extremism. Uh, obviously, debates about that, whether that definition is valid, for that's the, the way that in Bureau of Prisons training manuals the, the, the problem is framed. Uh, and I'm sure the, the way the definition on the state level, again, uh, I'm sure there's different, but then also on the state level, there's also some possibility for leeway in terms of how state statutes interpret uh, various forms of terrorism. But at least within the correctional system, when it comes to the problem of extremism, uh, in general, BOP publications make it relatively clear that it encompasses all of those different uh, ideologies and ideological groups. Um, well, uh, firstly, this overarching of approach to terrorism prevention, um, it's kind of con containing the definition we provided, covers a range of offences. You know, the, the, the hate crime and um, criminal um, civil rights offences and, 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 and others. So there is that. It's it's broadly captured in the proposed uh, program. Um, in regards to that question, should it be federally driven? There are responsible. 
the responsibilities that, that the federal government has in this space, um, moral, ethical, legal ones, um, the federal government has to be involved. The question is, how is it involved? To what extent is it involved? What's the scope of their involvement? And what this proposal suggests is a narrowing of that involvement that would then potentially facilitate a more flexible approach on the ground at both the state and the local levels. You know, this document, it, it's, been, it's been interesting getting feedback from, from, from people on this document, and I know, you know, uh, th it's been the same with these guys here, is that when people read the document through a certain lens, they kind of get interpretations out of that document. As Seamus kind of said from the very beginning, um, the nonpartisan approach that we kind of have, ultimately, you narrow that federal, that, that federal approach, that federal involvement, which creates greater flexibility at the state and local levels for them to engage however they see fit, really, you know. Um, but yes, the federal departments have to be involved. They have a responsibility to be involved. And I think that there is plenty of room there um, for, for that overarching coordination effort. explaining why we right. want terrorism prevention. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, no, it's, it, that, it's, that is an essential question. Why? Is any of this really, is any of this really worth it, you know? Um, um, my, 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 clearly, um, um, I, I have a position on this. Um, and I, I, I want to add that it's forged by not just my experiences as a researcher, but very much uh, as a practitioner. Um, um, ter terrorism prevention was the the frame that um, that we in the unit that I used to work for, which is essentially the equivalent of special branch, in, well, the Australian version of that. Um, so as I said, definitely at that pointier end of the CT spectrum. So I wasn't involved in the CD side of things, but I saw how how some of those principles of of, 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 of CB, the effect that it was having on on um, on 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 the most vulnerable, those who, who, who were the targets of our operations, for example. And so um, this principle of proportionality, of course, once you read the paper, hopefully, um, you read the paper and you can kind of um, critique its nuances, um, but this idea of proportionality is really important with this approach, and it's that um, I do not believe, and I 
think that my assessment reflects reflects that, and of course it's open to criticism. Um, but that this broad, sweeping kind of approach to this issue, I do not believe that is proportional. And when your approach isn't proportional to the to the problem, it can inadvertently create more problems. Proportionality matters, and I think that a, this large sweeping approach, we need to involve the health sector, we need to involve the education sector, that everyone needs to kind of be a pseudo-terrorism expert in order for this system to work, it just doesn't, it, 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 it has tended to create um, more um, problems than it's solved, is, is, is the perspective that I, that, that, that I bring to this. Um, now, I cannot speak on behalf of any specific administration, and you know I knew that there would be problems with this uh, language and the interpretation of the paper as a consequence of how it has been used. Um, but yes, the, the the first footnote helps to explain why it, it, it narrows down. The fundamental principle there is um, proportionality, and of course that rule of law issue. You know, focusing in on offences. Yes, does that mean that governments get involved later in the process? Yes, it does. Government's interventions are going to be later in the process. But it doesn't mean that there isn't space for, for that CBE type of activities, however described, to be implemented at that non-federal level. I'm not negating any of that. I'm just saying at a federal level um, that, that, that I think that it should be much, that it should be narrower. Al, did you want to, like, yeah. international context? Um, I think one of the points Craig touched on at the beginning was that the definition of um, CV became so broad that it became kind of ineffective. Um, and what I think is good about um, what uh, Carrara's run his paper is he narrows it down, uh, narrows down the definition of um, fencing terrorism, which, is, um, which is, can, be, um, can be enacted. This is not to say that all of the things which previously fell under CDE should not be done, just that they're not connected to preventing terrorism. We're very clear about what is connected to preventing terrorism, and some of the more wider societal aspects which were pushed under CDE should still be done, and, um, and I'm a big supporter of them, but they shouldn't be connected to countering and preventing terrorism. So unfortunately, we, we've hit against our time. The, the, the downside of being in the university is at some point, serious students are gonna come in and, and need this classroom. Um, let me just wrap up with, with a few things. Uh, one is the, the policy paper is available on our website, extremism.gw.edu. Um, next week, uh, Bennett Clifford's piece on prisons uh, and the role of correctional facilities and that will come out. And then the following weeks, uh, Audrey's piece on online um, interventions. The last point I would note is just if you keep your calendars, December 4th, uh, we're doing, uh, we're bringing in Tom Brzezowski, who's the domestic um, terrorism lead for Department of Justice, uh, to talk about these, some of these issues of a domestic terrorism statute. Uh, that'll be the Elliott School at, at 10 a.m. We'll send out an invite uh, in a few weeks, but now you've got your first look at that. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for coming today. Thank you.